This is part 8 in a series of videos in which I am developing this magnetic core memory system. As you can see I'm making some progress with it and in the videos so far in this series I've gone through the fundamental operation of the ferrite cores themselves uh, through the development of the various circuits and uh, how each one works and what it's there for and uh, we're now at the point where we're getting close to being able to do a full final test. We're not quite there yet, there's a few steps left, um, but these videos are intended to promote a book I'm about to release that details the development process for this system in a lot of detail. It gives all the schematics, explanations as to how the circuits work, all that sort of thing. Um, but the videos are intended just to give um, some basic information on how these systems work and how I went about developing this system. So in this video I want to do a full test of a single bit in the system. I now have the output buffer installed. Uh, all the various parts are uh, fitted with the exception that I've left some parts out of various line driver um, circuits so that I can isolate individual bits and te effectively test each wire in isolation. Uh, this arrangement in the middle with these, um, this jumper, I explained in a previous video that the system has a power on hold off reset circuit that is designed to prevent inadvertent writes to the core uh, when the system is powering up and it's there for a couple of reasons. Firstly, the system won't power up correctly without it because uh, potentially it can turn on both sides of uh, one or more of the line driver bridge circuits at the same time. And um, also we don't want the system doing writes to any of the cores during power up um, because obviously that could corrupt any data that is stored in them. So that's what this arrangement does. Now normally it's taken care of by the components around the IC, but I've um, temporarily taken that function and this arrangement is fed from another current detection circuit. And the reason it's here is if something goes wrong and I've, or if I've designed it wrong and made a mistake, I don't want to burn out the wires that are in the array. Not normally something you'd need to worry about, but this is, um, initial testing for this system so I want to uh, save myself any aggravation should anything go wrong. So what I've got hooked up here is the control and driver board. I now have the array plugged in as you can see. I've got uh, a breadboard with all six address lines connected. Six address lines we have 64 bytes of course um, but I've only got one of the uh, data bus lines connected. I'm testing each of the mats and the bits independently and um, I'm doing that to make sure that I've got them all connected up right and I haven't made any errors. Uh, I also have the read write line connected and I have the chip enable line connected and the blue LEDs that you can hopefully see are configured so that when we are in write mode, that's when we're feeding data into the board, um, they are showing the values of these jumpers that we're feeding into the uh, data bus and when we're in read mode they passively show the uh, value being fed out of the board from the output buffer. Um, so just bear that in mind they fulfill two functions and um, it's only when we're in read mode that they're showing the value being fed out of the board. Okay, so I've got address zero selected. So that's um, because I currently only have the X naught and Y naught drivers enabled. It's powered up and we're feeding the board with a series of uh, 500 nanosecond pulses. The pulse width that's been fed to it in this configuration is not critical as long as it's shorter than the uh, duration between reads or writes, then that's fine. The system's edge triggered, so it's just triggered on the rising edge of this pulse. I'm using 500 nanoseconds so that the pulse is shorter than the cycle time, so you can see what's going on more clearly. Uh, the system does also have some circuitry to automatically detect uh, when 
a read or write is required so it will act then like an SRAM and that makes it far more straightforward to hook up to something like a Z80 where it will just uh, do a read or write when it's required and you don't need to do, ex do an explicit memory read. Okay, um, so what we're going to do here is try and test the entire system as far as a single bit is concerned. So it will test uh, all the electronics uh, for a single pair of drivers. It will test the multiplexer, the read buffer, the sense amp, the input output buffers and of course the timing for the sequence generator. As I say it's powered up so what we'll do now is we'll try and write a 1 into memory. Currently the value coming out is a 0, that's why the LED is off, but I've got the jumper set to a 1. You probably can't see it, I can't quite get everything on the uh, screen at the same time. I've got the jumper down here set to give us a 1 that's been fed into the board through the data line. If I now move the read write line from read to write it should write this one into memory and the LED will come on of course because we're now in write mode but when we go back into read mode the LED should stay on because we then start reading from the address we've just written this one to. So I'll go back to read and as you can see the LED has stayed on. We're now continuously reading a one from memory. If we have a quick look at the output from the sense line for this particular mat, you can see that it's quite hard to probe this. It's noisy because I don't have the ground strap attached for this particular probe. So this bump on the left is when we are uh, flipping the state of the core when it's reading the one. And this negative going bump over here is where we're writing that value back into the core in the refresh part of the read-write cycle. If I change the value to a zero by putting us back into write mode and moving the jumper to zero, you can see that on the left this hump disappears and then we get this on the right appearing which is the inhibit signal uh, appearing on the sense line. Just swap probes and we'll now look at the blue trace and we'll look at the output of the sense amplifier. So again, this hump here is the um, output from the uh, sense line or sense amplifier caused by the inhibit pulse because we are currently writing a zero. But if we change the input to a one, you can see that on the left now we are getting the uh, output caused by the change in magnetization of the current core that we've selected. If we look at the squared up version of that, so we can see we're getting a nice squared output pulse which is the one value being read and if I change the jumper back to a zero that disappears. We can ignore these uh, pulses on the right again that's just the output caused by the inhibit pulse but in the portion of the signal where we're trying to read the data it's obviously a zero and if we go back to a one we can see that the pulse reappears. So we're getting nice strong clear signals, uh, nice reliable signals, we're not getting any issues there and if we try writing uh, some bit values into memory, currently we've got a, a one, we go back to read, we can see that the LED stays on, that's the value now coming out of the board. If I move the jumper that's controlling the input to a zero, the LED stays on because we're still reading the value out of the board, but if we now momentarily go to write mode, we'll write the one that we've just set on the jumper into memory, and if we then go back to read, the LED should stay out. So we're back in read mode, and we have successfully written the zero into memory and we're constantly reading it back out. I move the jumper back to a one. Uh, LED is still off of course because we're still reading the zero out of memory but again if we momentarily put the board into write mode then that zero, that one value will be written into memory. And as you can see I'll go back to read mode. So we've successfully written the one back into memory 
and we're now in read mode and the LED is showing the value coming out of the uh, memory. We'll do it one more time so the jumper feeding data in is now set to a zero so we'll go through a write cycle written a zero into memory back into read mode and we can see that the LED has stayed out and finally we'll write a one back into memory we're back in read mode and we can see that we can now successfully read and write bit values into memory so that's working as far as the uh, read and write of data bits is concerned for that particular uh, core but if we select a different address then we should not currently be able to store data at other addresses because I don't have the other line drivers enabled so if I change the address notice straight away that the LED has gone out uh, and that of course is because um, we're now trying to read a different core and the uh, drivers are not enabled for that and what we can do now is try and write a value to the currently selected address it should fail because uh, as I say the drivers aren't enabled so I've got the input jumper set to a 1 the LED will come on when we go into write mode because the LED will be showing the value we're feeding in but it should go out again when we go back to read mode because we have not successfully uh, stored anything in memory so we'll go to write notice the LED is on go back to read the LED goes out we'll try that a few times and however many times I try and write the value the LED goes back out when we go back to read mode which it should do because we're not um, able to write anything to the currently selected core if we go back to the correct address for the core that we do have enabled notice that the LED comes back on because we still have the one stored there that we stored before we changed address and again if we try and change the value there by selecting zero with the jumper and then writing that value back to memory we can once again successfully write to that address and we'll finally finish by writing a one back into read mode and as you can see that's working fine the chip enable um, line is there to enable us to completely disable the uh, output of the board from the uh, host data bus so if we change that to disable the chip notice that the LED goes out but if we re-enable the chip the LED comes back on because uh, the data is still stored in uh, memory and it's just re-enabling the output buffer now at the moment as I said we're running this with external pulses to drive the system and it can be automated if you want to but this external signal is not gated and what that enables you to do and the reason I designed it this way is if you want to the um, device can be disabled but you can still do a read you can't write to it but you can still do an internal read so you can do kind of a, a pre-access uh, read or read ahead if you want to without the memory putting the value straight onto the bus so in theory if you wanted to optimize a system you could do a read of a particular address and then further down the line you can select the device to read that value onto the data bus and that actually then gives you a uh, an access time for that data of about 10 nanoseconds which is obviously quite impressive for a system like this the normal access time if you are um, running the system in real time and just uh, writing the pulse to it and then waiting for the data to appear the data comes out onto the data bus about 800 nanoseconds 700 to 800 nanoseconds uh, after the start of the pulse so it's about 800 nanosecond access time but the memory cycle time is about 2.5 microseconds you could shorten that the second timer which writes the value back into memory is currently set to one microsecond 
but that could go as low as 200 nanoseconds and the delay timer that is delaying between the read and write cycles is also currently at one microsecond but could be much shorter so you probably could change the current cycle time from a um, little under 3 microseconds to about 1.5 to 1.2 microseconds uh, at the moment this is running at uh, 2 kilohertz so we're doing 2000 read write cycles uh, per second I have tested it so far up to 200 kilohertz and it seems to work fine and I've got a lot more testing to do yet to see what the ultimate performance is uh, but anyone that builds this might be interested to see uh, what they can get out of it and whether they can modify it to go even faster I didn't build it for speed, I built it to demonstrate the principles of operation but even so it's still interesting to see uh, what it can do so that's where we are at the moment, a few more steps and we should be able to hook this up to a microprocessor I'm intending to hook it to a Z80, write some simple code into a ROM and then we'll see if we can uh, maybe run some memory test programs or something simple to demonstrate its use with an actual microprocessor.